Our first scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from the death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Our second reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, oh, sorry. Chapter 18, verses 15 to 22. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I commanded. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall speak in my name. I will myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in, in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. You may say to yourself, how can we recognize a word that the Lord has not spoken? If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, it is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be frightened by it. And the last reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 18 to 23. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we, are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask. Are you the one who is to come, or are we, wait, are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And then he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. This is the end of the reading of the scripture. Reading from John, or from Luke, chapter 3. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, might he be the Messiah? John answered all of them, saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and with fire his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. 
So that's the story Luke tells of John the Baptist. Now given that story, how is it that just four chapters later, now the disciples of John brought news of all these things that Jesus had raised one from the dead to John. John called two in particular among his disciples and sent them to the Messiah to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? But, but, but the baptism story. Why doesn't he know? Why is he unsure? In Matthew and in the Gospel of John, at the baptism John clearly recognizes Jesus as the one who's to come. In Matthew's gospel, John, as Jesus comes to be baptized, John says, no, no, this isn't right. I'm not supposed to baptize you. You're supposed to, we're getting this backwards here. In the gospel of John, the Baptist looks up and sees Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are you the one who's to come or are we supposed to wait for another? Tell me what's going on here. Why doesn't he know? It seems from those baptism stories that John is pretty clear about who Jesus is. Why doesn't he know? That question underlies a lot of, especially early, but even now, Christian Jewish dialogue especially in those early years as they were trying to sort out who Jesus was and what had happened in this life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Is this the one who was foretold? Is this the one we were waiting for? In Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, which literally the name of means second law. It's a retelling of the law by Moses just before his death. After the people have wandered through the desert for 40 years, and they're about to cross the Jordan. And Moses has been told he will not cross the Jordan. Indeed, the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says, I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I'm not going with you, but I've seen it. It's right there. That's where Dr. King got that image. But the book is Moses reminding the people, this is who you are. This is who you're supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to live. And in the midst of the book, he says, there's going to be another prophet like me. God promises there will be somebody else like me. Which is one heck of a promise. Because Moses isn't just prophet. Moses isn't just the one who explains to the people how God wants them to live and shares the law. Shares the law because when the people got a glimpse of God's glory and heard the roaring thunder and saw the flashing lightning, think Charlton Heston and Mount Sinai. Because whenever we talk about Moses, there's at least somebody who thinks Charlton Heston. The people said, "Uh, no, we, we can't deal with that. You go up there, you talk to him. You talk to God, you come back and tell us what God says. Moses isn't just this person who has served as the messenger, the intermediary between the God who brought them out of slavery and the people. But Moses is the person who led them personally, physically, out of slavery. Moses is the person who has provided judgment and leadership. He's prophet, he's lawgiver, he's redeemer. So Moses says, another one like me will come. As time went on, and in the late period of the Greeks, the Persians, heading into the Romans, and Judaism developed this very strong sense of the Messiah, the one who would come, who would bring freedom again, would restore the people. It's my belief that those words in Deuteronomy, the the promise, the foretelling of a one like Moses who would come, get mixed into this image of who the Messiah will be. 
And so John the Baptist sends two of his followers to Jesus and they say, are you the one? And I hear in that question a variety of things. Some of it is that deep, deep, we've been waiting so long. We've been waiting so long and life is so challenging and the Roman foot boot is very heavy. Are you the one? Is it time? Promises that seem to take forever to be fulfilled feel kind of heavy after a while. Are you the one foretold? So I hear great hope, great longing, but I also hear some confusion because, as I said, in the baptism stories, John seems to recognize Jesus as the one. The one who's, the song of whose sandals John is unworthy to untie. Sometimes promises aren't fulfilled in the way we expect. Because the other thing I hear in John's question is, this isn't quite what I thought it would be. You aren't quite who I thought you were going to be. I don't see words of rage and judgment and winnowing forks and chaff in the fire. And... Did I get it wrong? Did I misread you? Are you the one? I was sharing in Bible study on Tuesday that in my first year seminary, my New Testament class, uh, the theme for our New Testament class that year was looking at Christology. Who is Jesus? And one of the assignments we were given we were given some readings from Jewish scripture and some readings from Jewish writings that were not in scripture but were from that late, late part of the before common era, before Christ, that described the coming Messiah, described who the Messiah would be, what the Messiah would do. And our assignment was to say, is this Jesus? I think there might have been some other readings involved too. It was 30 years ago. I, my <laughs> memory is a little vague. And it wasn't. And that's what I think lies behind John's question, is that Jesus wasn't the one they expected. And so the early churches, they wrestled with how what, what, what's just happened here? Looked at those old stories, looked at those old promises, looked at those predictions and said, okay, well, it wasn't quite what we expected, but something did happen. It wasn't the war horse and the Romans are still around and we aren't this independent kingdom again. We haven't returned to the time of Moses or even better than the time of David and Solomon. But somehow in Jesus, God redeemed us. God set us free. God reminded us who we are. We met God. And so their answer for the early Christian church was, yes, this was the one who was foretold. The early church answers John's question, this is the one who was foretold, which is more than Jesus does. Because in the passage that Keziah just read, Jesus' answer is, go take this news to John, what you have seen and heard. Doesn't say yes, doesn't say no. He says, go, tell John what you've seen. What does the evidence say? 
Because that's what the early church did. That's what in those first few years following Easter, the followers of Jesus looked at the evidence and said, yes. This was the one who was foretold. In this man, in his life, in his teaching, in his death, in his resurrection, we met God. This was the one who was foretold. It's not a statement of history. It's not a statement of fact. It's a statement of faith. It's a statement of experience. Thinking back even farther, at the end of either my second or my third year of my bachelor's degree, I took a course on Christian theology through the Religious Studies Department at the U of A in the spring session because I dropped a course during the winter session and needed to make it up. And one of the assignments I did for that course was looking at the use of Jewish scripture. It was either in the the whole Gospel of Matthew or just in the Sermon on the Mount. I can't remember which. I do remember the first proposal I made to the prof. He said, "Um, you might want to narrow that down a bit. And I remember coming to that conclusion, looking at it and saying, for all these years, people have said, How foolish the Jewish, the continuing Jewish community was because they didn't recognize who Jesus was. And that was when I started realizing because he wasn't what they expected. And then I reflected we, the inheritors, we who are the continuing Christian community, have within our midst people who will look at prophecy who will look at prediction and, well, as Drew Carey once said in a stand-up comedy routine, that he took out the book of Revelation one day and started checking off boxes. Yep, yep, got it, got it, got it, need it, got it, need it, got it. Because the Christian community has been equally clear that we will, well, those, those poor people in the first century, they didn't quite understand what God was doing. But when God does something special again, we will know because we have this long list of what's going to happen. We will know because we will recognize exactly what it was. That seems a little arrogant. God fulfills God's promises somehow. It probably won't be the way we expect. Because my reading of scripture is that it rarely was the way people expected. We proclaim Jesus, son of Mary, as the one who was foretold, the Messiah, the promised one, who would free his people, who would restore them to God, restore the relationship. We proclaim a hope that God will continue to break into the world and free God's people, We proclaim a hope that God will continue to break into the world and lead us to a better way of being, lead us to the kingdom of God. I just want us to remember that despite all the lists we might form, despite all the signs we might say, well, those are what we need to watch for. God might do it a little bit differently. Let's not ever be so sure that we miss what God's doing because it doesn't look the way we want it. Let's always have the courage of John the Baptist who had a very clear image of who the Messiah would be, a very clear image of who he was expecting, and yet also the courage and even the wisdom to say, is it you? Are you the one? What's happening here? What's the buzz? Tell me. May our hearts be open to ask that question. Because only then will we recognize what God is doing among us to fulfill God's promises. Amen.
Our hymn is a hymn of John the Baptist. 